then let me uh, introduce our next uh, presenter. Lydia Moland is Professor of Philosophy at Colby College. Um, she's the author of Hegel on Political Identity uh, and of Hegel's Aesthetics, the Art of Idealism. And she's also co-editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of American and British Women Philosophers in the 19th Century. She's currently writing a biography of the American abolitionist Lydia Maria Child, which will be published next year. Her paper today is entitled Poetry and the Sense of History, Images, Narrative, and Justice in the Philosophy of Right. Lydia. Thank you so much, Sebastian, and thanks to the other organizers of this wonderful conference as well. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say that, um, Terry, I wouldn't expect you to remember this, but I think we first met either in 1995 or 96 when I was still an undergraduate graduate at the University of Tübingen and uh, you were teaching a seminar on the phenomenology there which I decided to take because I had just taken some Kant and hated it and someone thought someone said well maybe you should try Hegel uh, and I did and the rest as they say is history. I got my um, courage up to come to your office hours one day and I don't know how long I bent your ear for but you were as everyone has been saying so generous and patient and at a certain point you finally said I'm so sorry but I think my wife is waiting for me downstairs and I just wonder how many times that's happened in a, in a whole career of um, being generous as you are and I want you to know that I think about that when I think about my own students and trying to replay that generosity um, in my own career so thank you for all of that. So I want today um, to talk a little bit about the connection between poetry and history. Um, so I'm just going to go through my um, the paper in some uh, limited detail and I should apologize to my internet has been a little glitchy so I hope the slides will carry through for me even if my video does not. So um, the first thing I want to remind us of is that one of the earliest examples of recorded history in Hegel's telling is also one of the earliest examples of poetry. So Hegel says, he uses um, this example here, 4,000 from the Peloponnese fought against three myriads. And here's what he says about it. Um, and this again is in the lectures on aesthetics rather than the lectures on the philosophy of history. The report is left entirely simple. The dry information that 4,000 Peloponnesians fought a battle here against three myriads. But the interest lies in the preparation of an inscription to relate this event for contemporaries and posterity purely for the sake of relating it. And so the expression becomes poetic, i.e. it is meant to be a poem or a making, which leaves the story in its simplicity, but intentionally gives special form to its description. So then I say, uh, the unknown author, in other words, accomplishes a moment of history, a fact to be conveyed to posterity for no other reason than merely to have related it. But why does Hegel call it, also call it poetic? And what can these simple lines tell us about the relation between poetry and history or about either in particular? Um, so here's something that will surprise none of you, um, just the general layout of Hegel's system. And I try to sort of trace our path through to the moment that I'm interested in, which is right here at the transition from the last part of objective spirit, namely world history into absolute spirit, and especially into its first part, which is art. So I just wanna call our attention to history as a transition from objective spirit to the reflection on human activities that characterizes absolute spirit. And remind us also that history tells a story. Uh, so it borders on a certain form of art insofar as it does that. And my hope then is that differences between history and art can help us understand what history is for Hegel. And then finally, um, to link to Terry's work, history is showing that the need to make sense of things leads to a conception of justice. So just a couple of words about the poetic origins of the Volkalstadt. And I think this um, links up to Anton's paper and a couple of other papers um, this weekend. 
So when Hegel talks about the Volkausstadt as an absolute power on earth, I think part of what he's channeling is the claim that you have um, a folk which is united in some ways around history and language and culture, and that that then becomes a state once it develops an explicit constitution and has legal conventions, et cetera. Um, and that the most powerful political entity for Hegel is the one that can combine those two aspects into one. But that then brings us to the question of how a folk comes into being. Um, and one thing that it has to do, and this links up to the last paper, I think, well, is through developing an idea of itself. And one of the ways this happens is through poetry. So very briefly, and this is something that I talk a lot about in my book on the aesthetics, um, individual self-consciousness, as Hegel describes it there, um, is facilitated at least to some degree, in some cases, by poetry. So Hegel likes to use this example, when in the dawn Aurora rises with rosy fingers from Homer. And if you'll forgive a very simplistic illustration, um, what he thinks happens when we hear these words is any individual gets an image in their minds of a sunrise. So it's not a matter of understanding the explicit words so much as it is um, having this internal image. So the succession of words, this is what poetry has in common with music, that it happens in a succession in time, is canceled and we get an image that's synthesized in our minds. And Hegel thinks that that experience is part of what makes us aware that we have minds at all. So my own mind becomes clear to me once I am actually aware of my ability to take a series of words and transform it into it's being transformed into an image is how um, poetry is like painting. So this enables uh, self conscious to some extent consciousness to some extent for Hegel. And then uh, on some level, this is also true of nations. So here are a couple of quotes. At the time of early nation formation, the poet was the first, as it were, to open the lips of a nation, to bring ideas into words, and by this means to help the nation have ideas. So it's a kind of complicated thought that a group of people could have an idea, but I think that's part of how Hegel thinks the folk actually constitutes itself. So here's another very simplistic um, image then of a group of people having something like um, the Peloponnesian War in there as an idea in their collective mind. Then Hegel goes on to say this happens most explicitly in epic poetry. So in an epic proper, the childlike consciousness of the people is expressed for the first time in poetic form. A genuine epic poem, therefore, falls into that middle period in which a people has awakened out of torpidity and its spirit has been so far strengthened as to be able to produce its own world and feel itself at home in it. And then Hegel also says there must be a sense of justice and equity together with custom and the general mind and character. But that sense should not yet be universally valid and independently justified form, right? So it's still at that moment between nation and state, between a, a people having this idea of themselves and they're codifying their political commitments in norms. So briefly then on the on history and the emergence of prose. So Hegel was belonged to the group of people who thought that poetry was the first articulation of language um, and that it had to decline as it were um, to get to what we now call prose. So the more language develops and becomes more utilitarian, it's used for arguments, cause and effect relations, transmissions of facts, um, and it becomes then, as Hegel calls it, prosaic. He says the prosaic mind has nothing to do with inner connection, with the essence of things, with reasons, causes, aims, etc., but is content to take what is and happens as just this bare individual thing or event. So what I'm trying to uh, show is lost in this transition is not only beauty, it's not just that prose is not beautiful, it's that it's not true in the more technical Hegelian sense, um, that it no longer tries to articulate wholeness. So it no longer tries to articulate the mutually creating self-determining identity of identity and division that Hegel calls the idea. So for instance, when we say Alexander conquered the kingdom of Persia, Hegel says this is a simple abstraction without any image. 
And so our eyes are not led to see anything of the look and reality of Alexander the Great's achievement. The same is true of everything expressed in this way. We understand it, but it remains pale and gray, vague and abstract. So how does poetry rescue itself from prose? And this is part of why modern poets' job is more difficult. They actually have to rescue the language from its prosaic tendencies. So Hegel says poetry must develop a more deliberate energy in order to work its way out of the abstractions in the ordinary way of putting things. It must diverge from that ordinary speech and be made something fresh, elevated, and spiritual. And it can do this in a number of ways, um, but mostly by making its content figurative or buildish, prompting us again to form a mental image that corresponds to something so familiar that it has become prosaic, perhaps through an unexpected metaphor or juxtaposition in vocabulary. So I use this as an example, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. This was a thought originally articulated by Theodore Parker, who was an American abolitionist, but it was made famous and poetic by Martin Luther King Jr. But I think in the intervening decades, it's become so common and so sort of ubiquitous that very few people when reading those words get in their minds an image of an arc bending anywhere. So it's, it's possible for something that is poetic to stop being poetic. Um, and then I just referenced this poem that Amanda Gorman wrote for Joe Biden's recent inauguration. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. So I think Hegel would say that's, that's fresh. It's, um, it's buildish in another way. It makes us think a little differently about arms and arms and harms and harmony and then ultimately justice. So then I talk a little bit about the emergence of historiography or Geschichtsschreibung as prose. So Hegel says, what is properly historical, whether in the nature of the case or its subject matter, takes its earliest beginning at the point when the heroic period, which poetry and art had originally to claim as its own, is ending. And when, in short, the definitiveness and prose of life is presented in the actual state of, of affairs as well as in its artistic treatment and presentation. In other words, when nations begin to adopt constitutions, form legal systems, introduce institutions for political representation, when they make the transition from nations to nations as states. So Hegel says, for example, Herodotus describes not the expedition of the Greeks against Troy, so he does not supplement historical facts by narrating the exploits of the gods. Instead, he quite simply describes the Persian Wars. Nevertheless, there is a way in which historiography is like poetry. So Hegel says historiography leaves room for one aspect of artistic activity. However much trouble the historian must take in recounting things as they actually happened, he must absorb in his mind this varied material of events and characters and recreate it and present it out of his own genius for our minds to grasp, obviously genius there being some sort of gesture um, at art. So by being able to arrange his, and, and organize his material well, the historian with this touch of genius can make a clear view of the nation, the period, the external circumstances, and the subjective greatness or weakness of individual, individual actors leap to our view. So again, with apologies for a simplistic uh, image, here would be a nation having this uh, leap to view through a very vivid description of Washington crossing the Delaware, we have a kind of collective image of what um, this national story means. And then Hegel says, in this sense, we speak even now of the art of historians like Herodotus, etc. But uh, the historian Hegel is very clear, may not allow himself the privilege of poetry because poetry alone is given freedom to dominate the available material without hindrance in order to make it adequate, even externally, to its inner truth. So poetic license, I think, is, is the way we usually talk about this. And so historiography, it seems, must be confined to objective spirit. The reflection on truth and what it entails must be left for art, religion, and philosophy.
But Hegel does leave open the possibility um, of seeking the absolute reasons for what happens to return, again, in Pinkard's phrasing, to trying to ascertain whether history makes sense. Um, but for this, they do not need poetry, they need philosophy. Uh, and I added this uh, phrase after Robert Stern's paper the other day, guess who, uh, guess who now gets to deliver this um, philosophy of history to us and Hegel is as always happy to oblige. So I just want to read a couple paragraphs now from the end of the paper where I try to flesh this last part out. So the philosopher of history's job is not to bring events or individuals before our inner imagination, but to achieve in thought an understanding of what these events mean. When we follow Hegel in doing this, we no longer have spiritual images in our minds of battles or sovereigns, at least not only. Instead, we understand history through thought. Philosophical history might therefore seem, Hegel admits, to be a process, quote, diametrically opposed to that of the historiographer. If that is true, it might be because such a history is not in the end for the historiographer, but for the philosopher to undertake. So Hegel duly undertakes it, and as to the question of whether history makes sense, his answer famously is yes. So then I want us just to think a little bit about what sort of story is Hegel telling and with what images. And I also want us to think how have stories like the philosophy of right, and this would again be to quote Pinkard, brought us to where we are. So how should we diagnose the effects of that story 200 years ago after its appearance in our own history and in our own quest for justice? Part of understanding history, as Pinkard says, is understanding of the paths on which we are dependent for having brought us to where we are whenever we undertake to determine what we might become. One of those paths is the philosophy of right. So how do we assess that path in our ongoing attempts to determine what we might become? There's no doubt that Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history evoke images depicting non-European nations as irredeemably savage or hopelessly childlike, or sometimes both. Hegel's story includes images of Native Americans whose, quote, main characteristic is groveling obsequiousness, and African queens who crush their babies in mortars. Even in his more generous assessments, non-Europeans, as Pinkard puts it, are for Hegel, for Hegel simply failed Europeans. And then, having called up these images, Hegel tells a story about them. That some are irredeemable, despite his own claim that all humans are free, that some are doomed to be shut out of progress, that some have earned their treatment as barbarous at the hands of the more advanced nations who, at the very moment Hegel was writing, were expressing their enlightenment, quote unquote, by enslaving and exterminating whole nations that stood in the way of their global ambitions. So I suggested earlier that for modern humans who ostensibly accept the claim that all humans are free, this means negotiating ever-changing calls for new kinds of recognition, new ways of conceptualizing justice. It means taking seriously new crises and new opportunities in the ongoing attempt to achieve justice for all. One way of doing this is to recognize that the images we form of other cultures matter, as do the stories we tell about them. Recognizing philosophy's roles in those images and stories matters too. If we are to take seriously Hegel's claim that our ethical obligation to treat each other is to make concrete freedom possible, then it is, in my opinion, the responsibility of scholars of this particular Heg Hegelian story, like myself, to acknowledge how it has quite, uh, to quote, sorry, I'm trying to get out of the light of my own window here, um, to quote Pinkert again, brought us to where we are. It is our responsibility to remind ourselves that Hegel argued in the philosophy of right that, quote, civilized nations are entitled to regard and treat as barbarians other nations which are less advanced than they are in the substantial moments of the state. It is also to take in the full force of his report that, quote, Africans are enslaved by Europeans and sold to America, but that bad as this may be, their lot in their own land is even worse since their slavery quite as absolute exists. So our acknowledgement of these aspects of Hegel's history, I think must be part of our determining what we are and what we might become. It seems to me to be our responsibility in terms articulated by Hegel himself to acknowledge ways in which old practices, 
a hierarchical story about world history or the creation of images of unredeemable barbarity, interfere with many humans' ability to be free, make it harder to return to poetry for a moment, for the arc of history to bend towards justice, or for us to lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms. Perhaps understanding Hegel on this point can help us, his readers two centuries after his own story was published to do better. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that paper, Lydia. Um, so uh, raised hands, get to ask questions. And our first one will be from Lydia Gurr. Who is muted? You got to unmute. Lydia to Lydia. Um, I'm trying to, I can't see you, Lydia, anywhere. You've just on my, anyway. Um, I'm still here. A, okay, good. Um, I, I have a question. Um, there seemed to be a hint at the end of your argument that when we make a kind of transition from the uh, Geschichtsschreibung or the Bildbeschreibung of poetry or history and poetry, respectively, when we're doing um, image production with poetry, when we're doing a kind of descriptive enterprise with history, there's a sense in which when we move to the philosophy of history, we leave those prior forms of description or writing, let's say, or narrative behind. Um, but then it seemed to be that when we leave it behind, we don't have enough resources left to think about um, the comparison of cultures, the barbarism, the injustice, the striving towards justice. Um, and if that were true, then it would seem that philosophy can never dispense with, that, with um, either poetry or the arts or with history, that it carries as kind of remembrance of things past um, these other forms. Um, I would say even, of course, art and religion. Um, and in, in in that case, I want to say why, I mean, it's, I'm just being provocative. Um, why then the sense of leaving them behind at all? Why is it we see reaching a philosophical um, perspective as an achievement rather than as a danger of, as I was talking about myself, a kind of one-sided abstraction? If we need to keep these other things in play, then it means that philosophy doesn't simply surpass art and religion, or if it does, it carries them forward with it. Um, and that, that keeps a dialectic between the different um, modes of thinking and production in view. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. That's, that's definitely the way I understand the way Hegel thinks of both art and religion, um, but in art in particular that, yeah, I think he makes pretty clear that we run a risk of losing a certain kind of access to um, truth if we don't continually renew our relationship to our language in ways that are not just discursive and not just prosaic. Um, and that I don't think there's any sense in which Hegel thinks that art should be left behind. Um, the passages that people have taken to, to suggest that I think just are not just don't suggest that. So for me, the question is what kind of access to what Hegel wants us to retain does art continue to allow us and I think one is definitely that we can yeah, we can see ourselves reflected in our own images, and then we can philosophize about them, um, but we won't entirely understand ourselves unless we retain that. But, but would that extend then to an argument about political thinking? You mean that I mean, we can't do political thinking without art? Just to be provocative, just I to would push certainly, the point home. <laughs> yeah, no, I would certainly argue that that's true. I don't know that Hegel would go that far, but I, I think he would. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that his um, placing art below religion and philosophy has been wildly exaggerated um, and that 
in order to think, to, in order to have a thriving and functioning political world, we need what it is that art allows us to understand about ourselves. And religion and history, I would say, with yes. it. Right. right. Okay, we're on the same page. That's good. good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next up is Anton. Um, thanks so much for your paper, Lydia. Really, you know, I'm stimulated and enlivened by it. I mean, partly for self-serving reasons, you know, because it connects to what we were talking about before. Um, and I have a, somewhat of a one-track mind, which you have triggered by mentioning Benedict Anderson. So I apologize in advance. But I'm, you know, in as you talk, I sometimes feel like Hegel like does have a kind of theory of the medium and that, you know, when he says that what's properly historical begins the prose of life, like he is thinking about how it is that just the sheer act of writing things down creates this new world of like codification, taxation, conscription, uh, legislation, right? Um, but then there's other times when he just kind of like seems to be operating on assumptions that he's not aware of or not in control of. And I wondered whether, you know, actually the judgment that other nations are savage or childlike isn't uh, just kind of like a thoughtless deployment of, you know, the principle that nations that aren't literate or aren't operating like on a primarily printed culture sense of rationality, like we, we can't do anything with them or they're outside the march of history. So I'm, I guess my question is whether you think that Hegel like has a medium theory of reason that is one that's attentive to the differences between oral and printed culture, or whether you think uh, he's insufficiently like attentive to, to that progression. Hmm. Um, well, prose isn't only written prose for Hegel. So, uh, and he, in the aesthetics, he uses the word prosaic to describe any number of things. Um, essentially whenever something fails to achieve the reflection of unity and unity and division that he thinks that poetry is, um, or that arts in general are able to, to get us to. Um, so I wouldn't, so yeah, it might be that he doesn't have a very sophisticated idea of what the printed word in particular contributes even to his own assumptions about uh, what other cultures are capable of or engaged in. Um, so I guess, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I, except to say that I don't, I can't think of places in which he explicitly says that. I mean, certainly when he starts to talk about his literature in his own time, he's talking about literature that is, that is in print, um, but he also is open to narratives emerging in other ways as well. So I'm not quite sure what to say about that, but I, except for that, I think you're right that it's certainly not something that he thematizes and therefore, I guess, by definition, doesn't thematize ad adequately. Yeah, I was struck by the, you know, the 4,000 Peloponnese uh, uh, inscription. I mean, it, I think it's more beautiful because it is written down, right? Like if, if this were a thing in Homer that like 4,000 people somewhere were killed by someone, I don't think that has the poignancy of seeing an epitaph, which denotes a grave, which mm -hmm. you know is connected to a place and a community in a certain way. So I, mm -hmm. um, anyway, I was just yeah very intrigued by that. Good, thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. I'm gonna let Bob Stern ask the next question so he doesn't stand under a four minute rule this time. Uh, go it's ahead. fine. I've got a very short question that easily fits under four minutes, and it's a question of from, from ignorance, as it were. Um, so. Uh, is you know given what you said about Hegel's um, yeah sort of contem rather contemptuous attitude to prose, what did he think he was writing in? Um, I mean, is it that this is a speculative kind of prose and therefore distinctive, or or what? Yeah, that would be my guess, right? That he and but this goes back to Lydia's question too. That I think he. So first of all, yes, I, I, and I know there are some people who would go much further than I probably would on this, that part of <laughs> the difficulty in understanding Hegel is that he's deliberately writing it in a way that requires some kind of aesthetic license or aesthetic sense of reading it in order just to make sense of it. Um, so he's not exactly writing in clear syllogisms. 
Um, but I think that, you know, again, back to Lydia's point, I think he would be very happy to imagine that he can get something achieved in philosophy that he does think is the most is the most um, complete articulation of this, but it can't be the only articulation of it. And it continues to need other forms of articulation in art and religion as supplements or companions or something like that. So, so he, I mean, philosophy is at the apex for a reason, for sure. Um, but I don't think that he thinks that it can continue to articulate what he needs it to articulate purely on its own um, without these other components. So it's not that he thought he had a special form of prose that got, gets beyond the constraints of others, as it were. I know, there are people who think he did, right, especially in the phenomenology. Um, so when mm. he's writing more like his romantic contemporaries, there can sometimes seem to be that feeling that kind of the more obscure and the less declarative, the better. Um, but I don't really feel like that's true in, in later Hegel, certainly to the extent as an informer. So I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't want to commit to that. Um, apologies for coming across all grumpy before. It's, it's, <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> it's just been a rather long day. <laughs> it no being apologies necessary. Half past seven here now. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, next up is Dean. Hey. Uh, Thanks, Lydia. That was a really great paper. Um, and I, I mean, I want to ask you about something I know you've thought a lot about, even though it's a little bit speculative. Um, I hope you won't mind. And that's sort of like the question of what poetry or what combination of poetry and history, or what, generally speaking, what poetry is appropriate to the modern world or to the, once we've made the turn to the Germanic realm, what art or what poetry could be adequate to it. And in, in particular, if you just look at the philosophy of right text, where he puts a lot of emphasis on like in 358, the infinite positivity of its own inwardness. So this idea of inwardness, which is apparently distinctive of the Germanic realm, is I gather what kind of puts it into tension with the aesthetic realm and maybe gives him you know, makes him go overboard a little bit sometimes in stressing religion and uh, philosophy um, over the aesthetic. And I wonder just, I guess one, I mean, I know we've talked about these or, and you've written about these issues about objective humor and his attraction to Lawrence Stern and sort of what he thought the, the sort of art of the future, at least the written art of the future was gonna look like or of the modern world. But I guess I was also wondering if you would, so if you could say a little bit about that, but also just, in your own terms, what you think the Hegelian view of of modern poetry is, whether there would be something like, you know, lyric poetry and Emily Dickinson or somebody who who actually seems to take on board what he describes here as the Germanic moment, but then would also in some certain respects seem to be kind of antithetical to other things that he says. So yeah, it's not so well formulated, but if you could no, say I'm, something. But my, my computer froze just at the moment that you said who, which example you were going to use. The oh, end I was going to use Emily Dickinson. So okay. uh, sort of what he would, you know, what his attitude was or should be towards sort of what I think of as the best uh, modern poetry, which is sort of like lyric poetry of interiority. It would seem to fit him, as, but it yeah. would also seem sort of a, a historical or something in a way that would that would bother him. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So as far as objective humor goes, um, my sense his talking about objective humor towards the end of, um, of the first of the second part of the aesthetics is that for him, objective humor is a way in which humans take something that seems to be of no intrinsic interest or, or no objective importance, let's say, so no longer writing about the great themes of history or even love or any of the themes that may have been taken up by um, earlier poets, but like in the example of Lawrence Stern, obsessing and using language to obsess about the little tiny things that humans imbue with meaning because we are now no longer as reliant on big narratives to give us our sense of truth, but we're working out our own role in the um, importance of things to which we give meaning. Um, so I think that's definitely part of what's going on when he praises people like Stern, 
Um, and as far as Dickinson goes, I, I'm so little versed in <laughs> using that as an example, but I would guess that he would see something um, similar there that in an attempt to be interior, but also um, attach that interiority to objects that we give meaning and describing those objects. Part of what we're doing is showing our, you know, post hegelian late romantic commitment to ourselves as the sources of that kind of meaning. Um, one of the things that I wish he had been less attached to was the idea of poetry needing to express an image because it's, as I've said, that's definitely a sort of crucial part of the way he talks about poetry. So you read a poem and it produces an image in your mind. Because I think conceptual poetry or poetry that, that is playing with language more than it is evoking an image is a fascinating test case for him. Because if language is something that we need to understand as our own creation and as um, both reflecting the way we interact with each other, but also the way our societies evolve and all of those ways in which I think Hegel wants us to understand ourselves as, again, participating in meaning creation. Um, I would hope that he would recognize that, you know, later poetry that is not just figurative, that doesn't call to mind an image of a Grecian urn or a nightingale or something can do really important work for us in understanding our own role in the modern in modern meaning creation um, as well. So those are just a couple of, of thoughts about how I think that would extend into the future. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Viren. Um, thank you very much. I, I, I really uh, enjoyed this talk. And um, I have uh, two very quick questions. Um, so the, the first one goes back to something that, um, that I think Anton mentioned, and that's um, your use of Benedict Anderson. Um, and because the the thing that struck me as um, when you when you mentioned when you mentioned Anderson in the paper is the way in which his analysis of of nationalism is also connected to certain art forms, but they're different art forms. Uh, specifically, the novel is really important, and there it's really important because of a certain kind of temporality, the narrative that the, that 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 a novel can can sort of allow you to think about. Of course, newspapers are also important. So print capitalism, something I think Anton mentioned. But it, that then brings me to the question of what is the temporality associated with poetry here that allows for national consciousness? Because, and you mentioned this a little bit in your, in your initial answer, but, but when you talked about the image for, for the nation to form it, you need more than the image. You need the image going through time, which is why another other would, others would say you need. That's why you need history for the nation, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so that's. I was just wondering how that works here. Um, and then the second question you can you can ignore because it's it's partly my my partly it's going to reflect. You might just tell me to go back and read um, Terry Pinker's book, um, but but you cite. Uh, a, a phrase that I don't think completely comes out and is explained in the paper, and that is the need to make sense uh, of things leads to a conception of justice that transforms itself into a conception of the necessity of freedom. Now, I was wondering if you could sort of unpack that, but of course that's going to need really, I should go back and read the book and try to figure it out myself. But, but I think the reason why this is really interesting, I mean, and this is in, really important for someone like I'm actually in a history department. And so, so then this really suggests that, you know, the very need to make sense of things requires us to think about justice. But of course, the question then is, what is this justice? And, and you know, because freedom, Hegel's freedom, we, most of us have some sort of a sense of, but Hegel's idea of justice is not that much discussed. Uh, and so, so, yeah, the relationship between those two would be great, but that you can skip if you, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're reading Terry's book again, although I, I will say that I think that is one of the um, important things in Terry's book in particular that I think I anyway was very used to thinking about freedom as the way of parsing this kind of thing, but justice is um, more complicated and another, I think, another kind of layer. Um, and I, I will say that it, 
I sometimes worry that this is wishful thinking on Hegel's part, right? That he seems to think that there's something about just trying to think historically that will lead us to some sort of conception of justice or at least conceptualizing justice. Um, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. Um, you know, it is if you're Hegel and you have this sort of overarching belief of, about freedom and the development of freedom and the progression towards freedom. Um, and certainly justice has to be part of freedom on Hegel's conception, but, um, but I agree that it, it's not the most obvious part of, of that um, articulation for him. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I would say that there is some concern in my mind as well that that's wishful thinking on Hegel's part, but it, it is certainly part of, his, um, of the trajectory he has in mind. As far as the temporality of images um, for the nation, that's a really good question, and I hadn't thought about it that I hadn't kind of um, extrapolated outward from what he says about temporality in the individual's understanding of themselves through poetry. That comes out much more clearly in his description of music, right? So he makes these very strong claims, I think too strong sometimes, about a self coming to understand itself only through time and time being best sensed through music. So sometimes it almost sounds like he's saying, unless you've heard some music and notice yourself putting, uniting those moments of music into a phrase or a melody or something, it would be hard for you to have a sense of self. Um, but I don't know how he would extrapolate that into a sense of how a nation would understand itself temporally. Um, it might be more important to think about the music that a nation produces rather than the literature that it produces in that, um, if you wanted to get closer to an articulation of that question. But I, I, I'm not so sure that there is a parallel. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, did you want to follow up? Well, no, I mean, I was just thinking like in the phenomenology he speaks of a, you know, what is it? A, it's a musical thinking, but he's somewhat critical there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so that, that you know, if I think this would open up into another discussion of, you know, what type of music, whether it's like opera or something, which right. then has kind of narrative already, right? So, yeah. so I think the, the pure music, I don't think that's going to work uh, yeah. for, for this, right? So I, that's, yeah, but it's yeah, an interesting, I think that, yeah. Yeah, good. I, I'm definitely going to think more about that because I, it, it is hard to imagine since a nation definitely is something that has to understand itself as extended through time, just the way an individual does, but what the sort of parallel explanation of that would be, I'm not sure. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. Okay, next up is Robert Pippin. Yeah, this is one of those, uh, could I ask you to speculate more kind of questions? Um, I think I think the question is in the spirit of, of, of your approach. Um, not so much about um, the systematic place of poetry within Hegel's conception of politics and national self-consciousness, but something like the historical place of, let's say, poetry as a, a figure for the arts in general, um, which is a kind of common trope that a lot of people use um, uh, in historical terms. I, I mean, uh, Hegel and his contemporaries were, were in a slowly democratizing society, but it was still uh, a society governed by elites. Um, and the main sort of characteristic of the elites was their uh, education, the, the quality of their, their education, which is it, by and large in France and Italy and Germany is, is still largely true, I think particularly in France. Um, but, you know, elite gymnasium educated students in Germany have a tremendous advantage, uh, social advantage in, in society given the educational system. So, I mean, what I have in mind is that uh, people like Hegel, when they quote something in the phenomenology or in the lectures on aesthetics, they're quoting from memory. Um, this is one of the reasons why he often misquotes uh, the end of the phenomenology, uh, because he just is so familiar with um, poetry. Uh, the same thing is true of Greek poetry. I mean, he quotes it from memory and translates it himself. These, are pe these people were asked to translate neoclassical French tragedies into ancient Greek as, as exercises. So the world they lived in and the place of poetry in a more, more general sense in that world is, um, you know, a, a long gone world. And um, I mean, we, I, I would certainly, I mean, I'm, my role in this conference seemed to be as a voice of doom, but, but here, 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 you know, we, we, we make art. I mean, we, 
in the 21st century collectively, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, with with uh, filmmakers around like Kari Astami and the Wagenstein and uh, the Dardan brothers and so forth, we make art that can show us ourselves, you know, and novelists like Pamuk or, or Kutsi or something weird. We're the equal of anybody in the quality of the art produced. But what's changed is the audience and the, the cultural place of uh, what Hegel calls Schöne Kunst. Uh, and partly that's a result of commercialization and commodification, of course, and uh, th there isn't a, a, a role in the life of a nation for um, art. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't mean this as a kind of a sweeping sort of Philistinism charge or something like that. Again, so I, it sort of sounds like where I'm heading. Um, but there has been the, the sort of the speculate more bit is the social position of the arts in general in the late modern world is so different. It's basically university culture, especially poetry, especially lyric poetry of the highest order is exclusively possible only in university culture. And the audience for that is much smaller than it was in the 50s and 60s. The last time T.S. Eliot toured the United States, he could draw 10,000 people to the University of Michigan football stadium. Um, I can imagine him getting, getting him 30 people in a seminar room at the University of Chicago on a good day. You know? Although the celebrity culture is another, another, another feature of all this. So uh, given the role you've ascribed to it, I think quite correctly in the way you've presented the importance of this kind of imaginative dimension in Hegel's account of national self-consciousness, um, what, what's happened? I mean, what, what, what is of any resonance of that dimension of the arts in contemporary life? Do you, do you see any or um, is there none? Yeah, uh, great question. And I, I think there's not none. Um, I mean, it would be, well, let me say one thing that is connected to what I said a moment ago about, ago about conceptual poetry. So one of the things that Hegel's very worried about in music, and I think correctly foresaw, is that the more focused music became on um, instrumentalization and on sort of music for music's sake, the less accessible it would be to your average person's feeling. And since music is supposed to be the art of feeling, there would be this sort of divergence between music as produced by elites and what your common person wants to engage their feelings. And I think there may be something similar that's happened in, you know, conceptual poetry or novels that are more conceptual that they don't play the role in your average person's life that even Hegel would have wanted them to play because it's almost as if they start spinning around questions about their own media and their own, you know, music around sound and painting around color rather than about subject matter. had some concerns about arts trajectory, just the arts becoming more and more sort of turned in on themselves and then not fulfilling their role in contemporary society as well. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that has happened in some uh, arenas. But I, I always think about this poem that I saw, that I unfortunately don't have up on my screen, but that was on the New York public subway at one point as part of a public poetry project. Um, you know, obviously there are people who try to do kind of poems a month <laughs> um, as a way to try to get people to think more clearly about the value of language and the way language functions in our culture. Um, so I'm always, you know, I always am happy that there are such um, initiatives. I do think that a lot of what we used to call television uh, in when I was younger um, is very deeply artistic now and does lead people to think carefully about the way not just images but also um, you know light and sound function in the creation of a world as visual as ours is, I do think that there's a certain amount of hope that some of that is um, of really high quality and can serve the kind of role um, of getting the kind of self-reflection uh, triggered in a general population. Um, but I, I definitely don't have a definitive answer. And I think I would still choose your option number one on most things. Um, so, but anyway, but the, you asked me to speculate. There, there's a little bit of speculation anyway. Okay, uh, next up is Eliza Little. <laughs> 
Um, hi, Lydia. Thanks so much hi, for the paper. Good to see you in face to face. Actually, we've never actually met you yes. all the time. Um, I, I feel a little bad asking questions since I haven't been able to make it to most of the conference. I'm, I regret that, um, but I figured I'd sneak in since there's some room in the queue. Uh, and I just wanted, this is really a follow up to Dean Moyer's question, um, because I think the thing that I really love in your book on Hegel's aesthetics uh, in, is especially the discussion of poetry and the way you discuss um, how poetry in some ways is the paradigmatic art insofar as it requires us to reflect on our own uh, sort of poetic creation of the world like in our acts of perception on a daily basis. Um, and that seemed on the face of it, at least, I think it goes along maybe with this more subjective, modern kind of poetry, but it seemed very far away from what you were talking about in the paper today. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you to say more about that connection. So specifically the way poetry in, in the, like the later things about poetry or, or, or yeah. how those two things go together, like how this sort of nationalistic, like image making capacity that poetry has for us um, on a social level, how that relates to this individual kind of role, this very almost very private personal role about um, me as a perceiver. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, it's, it's not unrelated to the question I asked Anton earlier, like how does Hegel bridge what he says goes on in an individual's perception with, with what goes on in, an, in national perception or self-perception? So yeah, Eliza's right that I, I try very hard in my book to argue that the arts for Hegel are really, there's the whole story in part two where he's talking about how arts express a certain worldview and then in part three I really argue he's showing how the various arts bring our own senses to our attention and bring our perceptual um, capacities to our attention and therefore allow a kind of self-consciousness that isn't um, possible otherwise. Um, and yeah, how that happens collectively is a, almost by necessity just much less um, definable or you can't really point it out, um, but it also does seem on some intuitive level to be true that a group of people, once they have a shared set of images or a shared narrative or a shared even sense of themselves through time, um, as we were talking about a minute ago, um, that somehow in a way that is related to, but not exactly like the way our own self-perception is facilitated by these things that national self-perception can be facilitated as well. Um, but I will admit that sometimes I worry that that's a, too big of a leap on Hegel's part, that he just assumes that what is true of the individual has to be true uh, as part of a bigger collective as well. Um, and I'm not sure that he gives a good argument for that. Thank you. Okay, next up is Berger Basmasha. Hello, um, Lydia, thank you. This was such an inspiring and uh, encouraging um, talk that you gave. So I think um, you reject one of the fundamental premises of the common way of reading Hegel's end of art thesis, that, um, that aesthetic forms of self-consciousness are perfectly sublated in philosophical prose without remainder. And uh, I think the implication is that we still depend upon art to understand ourselves as a uh, spirit. So I, I have like, two questions. Um, so um, like, what would you say about the implications of this thesis about um, regarding the intelligibility of the rest of Hegel's system? So like, would you argue that art and aesthetics remain an essential moment of the self-understanding of the concept, as in logic, for example? And the, the second is about the question of ecology that came up earlier, um, that <clears throat> in the lectures Hegel um, talks about art's role of mediation between spirit and nature. So can art be still considered as essential to maintain a form of self-understanding uh, that would not be in opposition to nature? Like, do you think that is relevant to your approach? Yeah, so um, on the first question, uh, absolutely, right? So I, I do think that um, when Hegel says that art ends, I take it to be a kind of parallel case to something I think I mentioned in a question yesterday that to history ending insofar as Hegel thinks, well, history, you have the belief in some cultures that one person is free and then some people are free and then all people are free and history ends there insofar as there's nowhere to go conceptually past all. And so everything after that is going to be a fighting out of what it means that all people are free. 
And I think something similar happens in art. Once, once art ends conceptually, so we get through the three historical stages and the five different kinds of art that he talks about, um, it's not that art ends or becomes differently. I mean, it's already a diminished capacity compared to what it was when it was actually defining or creating religion in history, but it is still going to remain vital to us just what counts as art and what art can do for us will forever be something that we're going to fight about. Um, but that's that's just part of the fact that of, of the, where we are in Hegel's development. So yeah, that's absolutely true. And as far as it mediating between um, spirit and nature, yeah, I do think that that's part of what has to be retained by art. So Hegel doesn't think that it would be a utopia if we could just get rid of our senses and only operate as intellectual disembodied creatures. Um, our sensuous nature is part of the true that is the whole as well. And so we need a way of sensing truth through our senses and our different senses allow us to do that in ways that are best expressed in art. Um, so yeah, I think that bridge between spirit and nature, especially if by nature you just mean our sort of situatedness in the natural world and in our senses, um, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we are at the perfect 55 minute mark. Uh, Stephen, uh, is your question, can it be short? Yes. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, very briefly, you've talked about the important the relationship between uh, history and poetry, and maybe even the, the importance of art and poetry for history. To what extent do you think Hegel was aware of the dangers of art and poetry taking over from history? And I, what I'm thinking about in our own time is the extent to which we get our history from Oliver Stone or Aaron Sorkin, and we think that's history. Now, of course, with the Tudors got their history from Shakespeare and that image of Richard III lingered for a long time. So do you think Hegel is aware of that danger that art can actually replace history? And if so, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, I could keep that short too. Yes, um, I do think uh, he was. And I, I think that's essentially what he says. It's a very clear warning where he says um, historians don't get poetic license, right? So they, they're not allowed to start embellishing and they, like, they have to report the facts as they see them. Where they are allowed some artistic license or some you know, poetic license, I guess, is in imagine helping us to imagine the facts so they can help us imagine with great great vividness washington crossing the delaware but they'd better not you know, monkey with the facts themselves because i think absolutely hegel was concerned that that now given the kind of understanding that we have about the kind of historical subjects that we are um, we have to be more attentive to that we have to be sort of based in the prosaic world and that's not a bad thing there are a lot of advantages to that we still need art, um, but we need not to infect the prosaic such that uh, we go back to a kind of um, privileging of the poetic over the historical when it's the historical that we actually need. Thanks. Okay, please join me in thanking Lydia for uh, her paper. We will return in five minutes to face the final boss, Chris Yeomans. Uh, uh, and here is presentation.